Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Julie Nelson from the MetHow Beaver Project. And this is a program on the incredible beaver that's co-sponsored by MetHow at Home and, and the Beaver Project. So welcome, folks. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Julie. Okay, well, I'm going to screen share here. Mm -hmm. Oh, you need to oh, wait. Enable, it. enable it for me. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Where did my, uh oh, wait a minute. There we go. And we'll put it here from the beginning. And full screen, hold on. Here we go. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining me. Um, so my goal today is to, I'm going to turn this off so I don't distract you from my fabulous slides. Um, my goal for today is to just give you a brief overview of beaver history and ecology, and then of course talk about the Meadow Beaver mm -hmm. Project's conservation and restoration work. So I'm going to start by saying that the aquatic and riparian habitat of the Meadow River watershed has a long history of stream degradation and channelization due to historic land use such as beaver trapping, mining, logging, irrigating, livestock grazing, and catastrophic wildfires. So the Meadow Beaver Project addresses these degradations by partnering with beavers to accelerate the aquatic and riparian habitat recovery because beavers are truly incredible. They are nature's engineers, keystone species, and vital to the long-term sustainable health and function of our watersheds. So we were established in 2008 in collaboration with state and federal agencies with the vision of responding to um, and adapting to climate change and its predicted impacts in support of people, the environment, and the sustainable ecosystem function. So with those lofty thoughts in mind, how do we go about doing it? We do it by returning these ones at, um, at ubiquitous beavers to the landscape and promoting coexistence to help rebuild beaver populations. We also, um, beavers and their dams are extremely important features to the landscape. So, yeah. Partnering with them yes, um, expands, expands numerous watershed benefits such as storing water, providing essential habitat for wildlife like fish and birds and deer and amphibians, and restores altered landscapes and streams, recharges aquifers, captures sediment, increases water quality and quantity, just to name a few. Um, beavers or, or in-stream structures, which I'll talk about so shortly, um, restore streams and increase riparian habitat complexity. It makes it nice and messy. Um, there's lots of research going on about beavers and wildfire. Um, two of our crew completed master, sorry, masters um, on that line of inquiry. And given the recent events, we know I know that they're being interviewed right now for some media pieces that are coming out soon. And finally, of course, to engage the local community in our work through environmental education and community stewardship opportunities. But before I get too farther along, I'd like to just say a few words about beavers in general, about their biology and their ecology, because that really has an impact on the work that we do. Okay. So worldwide, we have um, two species of beaver, Can Castor canadensis in North America. Um, they estimate historically we had numbers 60 to 400 million, but that was pre-settlement, so we were in just a wild guess. Currently, the guess again is crude, 6 to 12 million. I can tell you right now, Washington State has no idea what our beaver population is. Castor fiber is the Eurasian beaver. They were with throughout Europe, um, almost exterminated during the, the fur trade in Europe. Um, but they are slowly coming back into their range, which is pretty exciting. So beavers and water go together, go together like peanut butter and jelly. 
They are masters of manipulating the habitat to meet their needs, just like people. But unlike people, they are uh, who like orderly uh, environments. And so think about how we plant our gardens in rows or straight in streams. Beavers create jumbles of, of trees and, and vegetation and water pooling and spreading everywhere. But it's in those spaces that we find life supporting habitats for all things that swim and crawl and walk and fly. But how do they do their work? So first of all, um, they are the largest rodent in North America. And all they need to really to do their work is wood and water. Um, they range like from that map I showed from the boreal regions where they run out of wood all the way down to the arid lands in the southwest where they actually run out of water. But they're really habitat generalists and highly adaptable to the water sources that they find. Be it lakes or rivers or streams or flood plains or wetlands. Um, up in the right hand corner is a lodge that is up in Cub Creek. And down in the dam, I just wanted to make a note about dams. When they build a dam, they don't build one, but they build a series. And by having a series of linked ponds, then that enables them to get to additional food resources uh, more safely uh, and to avoid predation. So once they find a place and they settle in, they have a family life. They're very social. They have monogamous pairs, which is kind of cool. And they mark their territory by making these, taking mud, they pack it up into like a dome shape of the side of the water body, and then they scent mark it. They have um, kits, May to June, two to five, I guess we usually see around three, and those will stay with the parents for at least two years before dispersing. Um, and then when they disperse, ideally, they would go upstream or downstream, of course, depending on what the habitat calls for. Uh, their diet uh, in the spring and summer we we laughingly call it their cow season because they're eating all these grasses and herbs forbs and it makes it really hard for to uh, find them actually because they're not chewing trees so we're looking for different bites on grasses and stuff in the fall we call it the moose season for them because they're eating bark and the birds and ambient and stuff um, but they will chew bark year round because their incisors are continually growing. So you might find a tree that's just kind of gnawed on and that's just to keep the teeth um, short and sharpened. Their preferred food is aspen, cottonwood, willows, and dogwood and cattails. We find that the um, meadow beavers really prefer the aspen. It seems to meet all their nutritional needs. Where the Okanagan beavers, when we capture those, seem to prefer the dogwood over the aspen. Again, just the preference to the food that they have in the spaces that they live. Um, beaver ponds. Beaver ponds are fabulous. So beaver ponds um, are very dynamic systems and it's through this work that they have a lot of reaching impacts. So this is a pond that we've been monitoring down in Black Canyon for years. And what's amazing about this pond is that the water you see is only a fraction of the water that's actually being held on site. And this is what it looks like if you were to do a schematic. You can see the circle at the top. We have the beaver pond. It's just a small slice in all of the water that's available. So the weight of the pond presses the water deep underground where it's either where it's stored some of it under the pond, but some of it gets pushed laterally out and so it's hydrating those roots of those the vegetation which is really significant and it can push that water even further down and recharge aquifers so beaver ponds are really significant for water storage so here is an example this is the silver side channel down south of twist uh, this is a fantastic site so this pond is is, is a side channel so it's it's very long and this pond water is gonna be slowly released over time, which will help support the river uh, flow levels, as well as supporting the salmon that are up there. And in regards to salmon, these side channels are critical to their life, uh, different life stages. So salmon and 
beaver evolved over the past 10 million years or so. And these side channels are exceptional habitat in that the adult salmon will use them for spawning, while the uh, emergent fry will thrive in these slow water, high nutrient uh, ecosystems over the winter. These uh, juveniles that are raised in that system will be more robust than the juveniles that actually uh, are in the main river system. So during the high waters of spring melt, the dams will break and it will release the fry on their journey to the ocean. And then over the summer and fall, the beavers will rebuild and the returning adults can either jump the dam or they will find the adjacent spillways at the end of the dam and then return to those side channels. So it's this really neat um, cyclical e uh, event between these two um, organisms. But beaver dams get a bad rap. A lot of people think they're a barrier to fish when they aren't. I love this little schematic that somebody came up with. Um, the little fish, they are truly little. They can wiggle through the uh, sticks if they need to, to get out. And they really do have a lot more food in these slow water ponds. Um, then the next one, of course, which is really relevant today, is to wildfire and resistance. Lots and lots of research up and down the West Coast about the connection with beavers and wildfire. Um, one of our staff just finished her master's and her research found that beaver dammed riparian corridors are relatively unaffected by wildfire uh, when compared to similar riparian corridors without beavers. So again, the, the water is stored, it's moving laterally, it's making all that beautiful green vegetation and it provides a wonderful escape for animals large and small. Um, and these ponded waters, uh, as they saturate the roots, makes it really hard for those plants to ignite. I think we can probably have all sort of witnessed this around the meadow uh, when we had our fires, how the forest became very quiet and all the animals kind of moved down towards the water. At least where I live, that's what they were doing. Moved down to the ponds where, where I live. Um, so here's some examples from uh, some of the places that we've released beavers. So in 2015, this is Black Canyon. And on the left side, you can see uh, it was burnt and it, that included the lodge burned too. And on the right side, it didn't burn. Uh, the beavers did survive, but they didn't stay. Obviously they didn't have any food resources, but um, we were pretty worried about them when that happened. On the right side, this is Lightning Creek, it was burned. In the tripod fire of 2006, um, this site looks very similar to the prior side slide that I shared. Um, again, it's all burned around it, green oasis in the middle. We have beavers in there since 2008. They are still there. It's a very active site. And it's been fun over the years to watch the vegetation just fill in and get thick. Um, it's really hard to walk around in there now because the vegetation is so thick. And the ponds are really deep now, which makes it uh, pretty exciting when you're uh, walking log to log there across some of these beaver channels. So what else do beavers do? They are a keystone species. So throughout the mountain, intermountain west, wetlands only make up 2% of the total land area, but 80% uh, of the wildlife uh, use it. Beavers are referred to as keystone, meaning that they uh, support an entire biological community by being there. Scientific research has shown that there's more biodiversity around beaver ponds than ponds without beavers. So the ponds support and enhance flora, fauna, fowl, fish, amphibians, many of which are obligates to those wetland systems. And so it's a place where ducks and birds can nest and rest and, and Frogs and turtles actually migrate on those beaver dug channels, which is kind of some new research. Bats forage, moose find food. I mean, it's this beautiful artistic rendition of it. It's, it's a really dynamic place. Um, <clears throat> also due to climate change in the Northwest, we're seeing more precipitation and less snowpack, and we're having earlier spring melts each year. So beaver ponds are considered a climate adaptation strategy because they compensate 
the lack of snowpack by capturing, slowing, and holding the water on the landscape longer, preventing it from racing downstream, which is really critical in our arid environment. So those are just some of the benefits that beavers provide by being in the, around our little landscape. But how come our landscape isn't full of beavers? This is the question. So I'm just gonna step back just a little bit in time. Um, there's a lot of research on this. I'm gonna just kind of scoot over this kind of quickly. So over the millennia, really beavers and glaciers slowly modified and sculpted the landscapes of North America. Beavers play a central role <clears throat> in religions, cultures, and diets of the indigenous peoples from coast to coast. However, the pursuit of beaver pelts lured Europeans who had decimated their own beaver populations to the New World, and beaver pelts became the currency of the day. So just about every significant American geopolitical event between European arrival and the Civil War is based in some fashion on the beaver trade. For example, the Proclamation of 17. 63 barred colonists from settling west of the Appalachian to prevent them from disturbing the British fur trade. The War of 1812, Canada and American traders sparring over beaver-rich lands around the Great Lakes. In an order to claim new trapping grounds, Thomas Jefferson purchased the Louisiana Territory. Fur companies competed and raced across the nation, decimating the beaver population. The Hudson Bay policy was to create a fur desert, basically the lethal removal of all fur-bearing animals wherever they went to prevent settlement. And that included the Meadow Valley. So over the course of, the beaver, of a century, the beaver population declined from millions to about 100,000. And it's estimated that 90% of the beaver population in the Meadow Valley was removed. So, out with the old, in with the new. So people started to settle and move across the country, and as they did, they changed the landscape to fit their needs. Rivers were straightened and diked. Farms sprung up in the fertile river valleys. Cities grew, natural resources extracted, and the river systems changed. Beaver dams act like speed bumps, slowing the water and its erosional forces. So like you can see with our little happy beaver green check. Without beaver, ponds drained and the rivers run wild and the erosion forces cut down the river banks, as you can see in the other photo. Once the streams are in size, beavers have a difficult time reestablishing as the water is confined to a channel, kind of like a garden hose, and it doesn't have the ability to spread out and slow down. And many of the creeks are throughout the West very much these incised channels. So part of the Meadow Beaver Project's work is beaver restoration. So we want to reestablish beaver colonies, again, for water storage, to improve the water quality and quantity for people and wildlife, increase wetland habitat, wildfire resistance and refugia, ecosystem resilience in the face of climate change. So where do we get beavers? Well, we work with landowners and we emphasize coexistence. And so does DFW, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. We really want to leave beavers where they are because that's where they're going to thrive. They'll do better than being relocated. But if we have to relocate them, we live trap them, called a Hancock trap. We live trap them and we take them to the Winthrop Hatchery uh, where we have some dedicated race ways. Here they have these cute little cement houses. Um, so the, the cement blocks are great because it's a, a thermo. So they're war warm in the cold temperatures and cool in the, in the warmer temperatures. And so they have water in, and we feed them aspen and commercial ro rodent shell. And it's there they will be reunited with their family members because when we trap, we wanna make sure we get the whole family. Or if it's a dispersing um, two-year-old, and we would try to do a little uh, matchmaking and try to find him a partner. Because the theory is if we put them out together, being a social animals, they will stay where we put them. 
we just put them out by themselves, then they will leave whatever site we've selected to go find a partner. And we try not to keep them too long. So when we do release them, um, one of us crew will go out and evaluate the site to make sure it meets the requirements. We need water, certain water depth. Uh, we want to know what the food availability is and what that species of food is. How far do they have to go from the water to get to that food source? Do they have the appropriate building materials, both in stream, so they really like mud, or the woody plants, and do they have cover from predation? And these are some of the volunteers from our uh, beaver naturalist program who love to come and help us with uh, beaver releases. We also have academic connections with various universities, University of Washington, Washington State University, um, PSU, Puget Sound University, uh, Eastern Washington University. And sometimes we have them come out and they're working on their own personal research, but we also like to engage them in our work as well. So these are two young ladies from uh, Eastern who came last summer. So we'll put them out and the question is, well, how fast do they work? It all depends on the beaver. On the left-hand side, um, we released two, I don't know where the male went, he kind of boogied out there pretty fast, but the female stayed. And in the course of a week, she was able to um, elevate the water quite substantially. On the right side is a pond that over the course of several years grew in size. So it's kind of fun. It's really exciting to see how much water they can hold and uh, see them do their work pretty fast. Here's another pond that was kind of a surprise until we get down there. Uh, this pond was actually on Beaver Creek a couple of years ago. And unfortunately now, Beaver Creek is a very dynamic system in the spring. And so the water moves pretty quickly through there. It blew out and filled in but it was pretty neat when it was there. Um, it was quite a few beavers. I guess because it was called Beaver Creek. Okay. So we do have some challenges though. I mean, they want to build habitat for themselves um, and we, want, we have goals for them, but they don't always work in the same fashion because their habitat um, enhancement might uh, flood some roads, uh, flood out houses, um, they definitely clog culverts. A culvert to them um, is just a hole in a big dam. Um, and they're, they're very good at this. They can pack a culvert in about a, an evening. Um, they do eat on the trees. So it's trying to find a, a balance between people and beavers to be able to share the same spaces. So we, uh, emphasize the coexistence. And so we do it in a couple of different ways. Working with landowners, standing on the site, talking about what's going to work for that site so they can coexist. So one of them is in that lower right corner is wrapping trees with deer fencing. Uh, it's really quick and easy. Well, it's a quick, easy sometimes. Um, so it's just wrapping the tree, making sure the wire is about a foot out from the tree trunk and high enough so that when it snows, that that tree is still protected, that beaver's not going to get up on top of that snow and then reach up and cut the tree. It still has fencing. The other one, um, the upper right hand corner, that's a culvert protector. And so it's narrow by the culvert and then that fencing fans out. And we have this, if you want to go see it, it's up at the intersection of East Chiwok and um, Bear, is that right? Going, going to um, Perigen Lake. And right at that intersection, it was, the beavers just plugged it every night and we were either taking those, the, taking it apart or the uh, road department. And it's, it's a very dangerous uh, culvert because they had a lot of suction and really wanted to suck him down and take him through the, the culvert. So we put the protector in there and it's been there about five years now. And because this structure fan, it's wider at the top end of the pond end, 
it discourages beavers from building because they can't hear the water. And so what happened is that there's actually, they're building a dam further upstream away from them. So that worked out pretty well. The other one down below is called um, the, is called a pond leveler. And we just installed one of these. And there is, uh, the cage is on one end and then you have culvert piping that goes along the bottom of the pond. And then it goes through the dam at the water level you want. So what happens is that the water is going through the tube in the, in the cage and leaving and they can't hear that water leaving the pond because hearing water move is what triggers their building. And so they stink the cage, the water goes through and all should be good. And we did put one in and so far so good. They're still there. Um, it's been kind of fun. We put up some cameras to see the activity. And they've been in, they've checked it out. They haven't done anything. Um, but we've also caught a lot of other wildlife that crosses crosses the dam as well, like turkeys and herons and deer and bear and cougar and stuff. So um, really leading these, the pond is the goal and coexistence with people. So it, we're working on this one. This is a pretty exciting. Okay. Another thing we've started to do, um, there are beavers and the site is degraded is to jumpstart the system. So there's no beavers, there's nothing there. We can install something that's called a beaver dam analog. So it's, it mimics what a real beaver dam does. So posts are driven into the stream bed across the stream and then woven with materials that are on site. And the benefits here, let me give you a better picture here. This is what it looks like up close. You have those posts going across and then weaving it in. And what happens is that just like a real beaver is going to capture sediment behind the dam and it's going to raise the stream bed and reconnect it to the floodplain. That water again is being pushed out and it's going to rehydrate the stream side vegetation, adding um, complexity or messiness to the stream, which is beneficial to fish and other organic or other aquatic organisms. And we're kind of like building a starter kit for these beavers because if it's too channelized, they can't get in and work. It's just frustrating. So we're basically, we're jump-starting this. We're slowing the water down. We're getting that vegetation to regrow and naturally, hopefully, recruit beavers in to take over maintenance of these structures. Okay. We also do education and outreach. So it might be school groups. Um, on the left was a group of students who came up from Pateras, which was a couple years ago, which was pretty cool. Up in the right-hand corner, we always participate in National Fishing Day, so we have a little booth out there, activities for, for kids and adults, and then, of course, educate about beavers and wildlife. And down in the bottom right corner, um, I said DFW, in order to do the work we do, trapping and moving animals, you need to be certified through the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And since the Meadow Beaver Project is considered one of the premier projects in the country, we have um, other beaver groups come to us and say, teach us um, how to handle beavers, how to do your work. And we loved sharing those and we love learning from them. And everybody has kind of different situations. So it's a great opportunity to cross pollinate ideas and problem solve each whatever the problems might be. So that's kind of a, a fun thing we look forward to every year. So finally, to just wrap this up, beavers provide ecosystem benefits, but need help, whether it's through BDA or placement of wood in the stream to jumpstart them, to slow down the water so they can gain a foothold for establishing those wonderful ponds. And of course, coexistence is the key to building, rebuilding beaver populations. Beavers build climate resistance, which is critical for salmon recovery, biodiversity, and ecosystem function, and for us. And beavers and their influence are just kind of this lovely bright spot in, among the many environmental woes we are facing. We just need to step back and allow them to do their work.
So thank you very much for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I do want to add on, and I think some of you heard me mention this as you were logging in. On Saturday, this Saturday, we are hosting our second annual Beaver celebration. And we have a key speaker, or, or our key speaker is Frances Backhouse. She wrote a book called Once They Were Hats, which is this wonderful review of, of Beaver history. And we're going to be showing the documentary Beaver Believers. And I'll send Tracy the link so she can share that with you um, later. So any questions, I would be happy 